Hey everyone, uh, my name is Keshav, and today I have here with me my partner, Andy McMullen. Um, he's the reason, you know, I'm able to get into the game of commercial real estate. And Andy and I both love Build to Rent, so that's what we're here to talk to you about today. So we'll go for, we'll aim for 30 minutes, hopefully. I love to talk, Andy loves to talk even more. <laughs> so um, please throw your questions in the chat and if we're doing a good enough job, we should hit them along the way. If not, we'll get to them all at the end. And with that, let's get started. So we'll start off with an introduction about ourselves, what we do, what is built to rent? Why does it make sense now? Is it too good to be true? Give it, give you guys an objective view of the pros and the cons. What do these opportunities look like? And some next steps, how you can reach us to learn more, et cetera. Uh, classic legal disclaimer, we're not investment, tax, financial, or legal advisors. Everything here is for educational or entertainment purposes only, as everyone's saying on social media these days. So just keep that in mind. So a quick introduction about us. My name is Keshav Kolor. I've uh, been hosting the weekly events here, also the founder of Cloud Capital. We help busy everyday investors passively add real estate to their portfolio. And we have a smart, savvy real estate crowd here, so I'm not going to go into the advantages. But our experience, obviously most of this, actually all of this is in these uh, 25 plus years in the industry, $750 million of project value, $130 million of equity raised, and over 2,000 units currently under management. And Andy, please tell us more about yourselves, yourself and your journey. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just tell a little bit. I, you know, so I've been in this game, as you guys can see, for quite a while. Um, struggled um, kind of in the Venice Beach, Santa Monica area. Um, started to learn a little bit more about development, developed some of the uh, built to rent projects down there in uh, Venice Beach. And then we kind of started uh, looking at more multifamily projects to invest in. Um, kind of felt like that was a, a, a great fit just with, as you guys all know, the depreciation opportunity and the the, the loan pay down and, you know, potential for uh, for quite a few, um, you know, additional uh, opportunities. Um, but I also started to get turned off a little bit with California. So we owned a lot of stuff in kind of central California, southern California. I'm out here in San Diego. Um, and we found that there's a lot of great opportunities that are cyclical in very many markets. So many of you guys might remember well, probably none of you remember, honestly, but 2008, before 2008, real estate was very localized. You had, you know, ascending markets and descending markets, and then the music just stopped for everybody when the the loans just completely shut down, right? So it just became kind of a national, you know, crisis with real estate. I think we're starting to see it a lot more um, localized now, which is why Keshav and I are so, um, you know, eager to share with you our, our views on built to rent, because I just think that there's a huge, huge opportunity for investors. Um, and, you know, we'll get into it a little bit, a little bit later, but that's just a little bit about what, what I'm looking to communicate today. So our business strategy, uh, both of us, we just invest in apartment complexes, anything 75 units and over, well, probably more like triple digits now, hundred units or land where we can build homes and rent them out. Again, 100 homes or more. And that's what we'll be talking to you about today, built to rent. And we invest in the Southeast, you know, as a lot of people like to do nowadays, landlord friendly markets, market growth, job growth, population growth. Uh, current portfolio, so just closed on 300 apartments in Houston, Texas. We're building 98 homes in Lafayette, Louisiana another 158 homes coming up in Foley, Alabama, and a couple more in the pipeline. You know, again, built rent deals that we're very excited about, but we're still in the early stages of them. So, you know, maybe on a future webinar, we can discuss those. So what is built to rent? Built to rent is single family homes built in communities, but managed as rentals. So not sold off to me or you as home buyers, but managed as single family rentals. Another way to think about it is horizontal multifamily. 
And in contrast to your typical suburban communities, you have amenities and a sense of community as you would in apartment complexes. You have that pool house, that clubhouse, the fitness area, you know, doggy park, playground, etc. But you also have your own, you know, backyard, a lot of privacy, a lot of spaciousness for your kids and dogs and pets to run around. So it's a nice blend of both apartment and home living. Vishav, and you might, um, and um, Andy, you might get into this later, but uh, what do typical syndicators of built to rent uh, do as an exit strategy? Do they keep their uh, investment portfolio uh, long term or uh, do they try to formulate some type of exit strategy for their investor? Yeah, it's a great question. Keisha, do you want to get into it a little bit later or do you want to? Yeah, it's the next slide. Okay, okay. okay. got it. He's reading John. your mind. John's always a step ahead of me. So as John mentioned, built to rent is a nice process. One of, you know, one of the pros of it is you have multiple exit strategies. At the beginning of the process, uh, you buy, you have just land, right? And you have, what we do at least is we place the land under an option to buy. So we'll put similar to like hard money down, I guess. The sponsor team will put, you know, hard money down. Maybe it's 20 grand, 30 grand, et cetera, on a land. I think we're putting, what, 30 or 40 grand down on Broussard, right, Andy? Which is going to be a total purchase. For the option. So our option is going to cost 40 grand, and the land is total going to cost 1.8 million. So what that allows us to do is we don't have to buy the all, you don't, we don't have to shell out 1.8 million right off the bat. We put 40 down and that's, you can think of as hard money. And we use the next six months or so as a sanity check to make sure that we can build the homes and the community in the way we want to, that the city officials love what we're doing, the community loves what we're doing, that there's no crazy terrain or you know endangered species we have to worry about. And that's really phase one. You know, You kind of make sure that there's no reason that your development will fail right off the bat. So you talk to the city officials, get your engineering studies done, go to a lot of, you know, government hearings, et cetera. And so that's called the acquisition and legal phase. And at the end of that, what you have is land that's entitled, the city's on board, the community's on board, you can start building. Now you can sell here, right? You can sell once your land's entitled because you've created value. You can sell it off to the next guy and tell him, hey, the city's on board, the community's on board, you can start building. And there's profit to be made here because it is the riskiest portion of development, but because it's the riskiest, as the old saying goes, this is also where you'll get the highest reward. And that goes on into the second phase, the horizontal infrastructure. This is where we start building. So at this point, we have the green light to go. We're going to start building roads, sewers, utilities, power grid, curbs, sidewalks, anything that goes side to side. And again, here, this you know, it could take anywhere between eight to 12 months, depending on how big your site is. Once you're done here, you've created value again, right? Because now all that's left is you have to build homes vertical. And so some people, what they do, they'll sell at the end of the horizontal phase to some other guy and say, hey, you can finish building, the, you can build the homes. I finished the utilities and the infrastructure and all that. So that's exit point number two. And this phase is a little less risky than the acquisition phase, a little less reward, but you know, riskier than the vertical and more reward than the vertical phase. And finally, in stage three, you're ready to build homes. So that's you'll build them in groups of 10 or 20 at a time, lease them out to people, move on to the next 10 or 20 until you've built all the homes that you intend on building, right? So if you have 100 homes, you're going to build them in groups of 10. You'll do that 10 times rent them out as you go until you finish building all 100. Now here's where it gets interesting at the end of phase three. Again, you've created some value because you have homes now and you've stabilized them, meaning they're renting out, operations are all running smooth. You could do a couple of different things. You could sell it off to one of these big institutional buyers. You could sell it off in pieces to a bunch of different groups, mom and pop operators, other syndications, or what you could do in to create legacy wealth, which is an idea that you know Andy and I like to chase, you know, create assets that our kids can have. 
even though that's a long time away for me, is you refinance your money out of the property, out of the asset, and any investors who want out, you just buy their shares out and you hold it for cash flow, you know, for decades to come. Yeah, and I think the, the, the interesting thing, for instance, the Lafayette project, they were all individually platted. So if we wanted to sell them off in groups of 10 or 20 or 30, we could do that. If we wanted to sell them to one institutional buyer, which we're seeing a lot more institutions going into that area, right? Because they're all chasing yield for CalPERS and CalSTRS and their pension funds. So as the rents increase, they really want to make sure that they've got their investors in high yield um, you know, vehicles. So, so that, and, and so that's one way. And then to answer your other question, John, you know, if we did our Foley Alabama project, we're going to basically sell it as one subdivision. So 155 units, 158 units to one investor. If we decide we want to individualize those units or condominiumize them, we can do like a condominium overlay, or we can, um, you know, create an HOA and then individually plat them. So there's multiple exit strategies depending where we are in the cycle and what the market forces are kind of dictating we do at that point. Um, and Andy, you mentioned uh, the word plat a couple of times. Could you explain for those who don't understand built to rent what that exactly that means? Yeah, if you, if you just kind of consider your individual lot that you would have in the simplest terms. So let's just say that uh, you, you, you own your house and it's on a, a lot of land that's maybe, you know, 10,000, 20,000 square feet, whatever. I'm sure you guys are probably close to the 20,000 square footers, right? So you, that's that's kind of separated by other houses on your street. And those are all individually kind of platted. In multifamily, you would have units together in one subdivision, one, one, one area that you could not condominiumize as easily, right? So you've got to wait for the entire structure to be built, and then you would have to uh then you could stabilize it individually platted just means one individual house we can rent it stabilize it and if we wanted to sell that individual house we could got it thanks yeah yeah we'll definitely get into the numbers um approximate numbers on one of the opportunities we're working on right now so this is so that's how built to rent works and let's go into why it makes sense now right construction is risky there's there's no understatement there to be made there. But there's always a balance between how much risk are you going to take on and what is the reward, right? So built to rent really started becoming an industry trend around 2018. And back then, you know, here in the figure on the left, John, are you able to go into slideshow mode? I am, yeah. Um, give me one okay. sec. Okay. In 2018, homes, the median homes, in these built rent communities going for around $220,000 at the time. And that was a you know five and a quarter cap rate. And obviously because of the market, increased competition, low interest rates, cap rates have compressed. Now they're tr these built rent communities are trading around three and a quarter, but the homes are being bought at almost twice the price that they were being bought at four years ago. At, now they're almost at $440,000. And not only is that price increasing, that price is 20% over what your American home buyer is paying typically. Your, your American home buyers on the median paying around $368,000. So institutions are paying a 20% premium for each home in these built rent communities. Because like Andy said, they realize, you know, they need to provide a yield to their investors and built rent is providing that yield for them. And the other, you know, the flip side of this coin is that mortgage rate, mortgage rates are going up, right? Back towards the end of the last year, it was three percent for thirty-year fixed. Now it's getting closer to, you know, six or seven, I believe. And what that does is, home prices do come down, yes, but your monthly payment goes up by, you know, hundreds of dollars. I think Andy, the figure you mentioned was a differential of eight hundred dollars or so yep. between renting and a mortgage payment. So you have to think, you know, your target crowd in the real estate market right now are Gen Z people and millennials, mostly millennials. Millennials have seen the 2008 recession. They've seen the COVID recession. 
they have student debt, they're not doing as financially well off as previous generations, unfortunately. And so for them to get into the entry home, it's a lot more difficult now. And if they can't buy a home, then that unfortunately puts them to rent. Um, in addition, right, additional numbers for you guys on who's like invest institutional investors that are buying this. Currently, institutions own about 5% of rentals in the market, and that's from a uh, Yardi Matrix report. But the same report predicts that institutions will own 30 to 40% of the rental market by 2040. And that sounds crazy to say, but if you think about the fact that in this last year, a quarter, like every fourth home, one in every four homes was bought by an investor, it's not that far-fetched. And when you consider just how much of the multifamily market that Wall Street controls, right? It's over 50%. So you can see that we're in the very early innings. I mean, if you look at many of the markets around the country, we're talking about 2,000 here, two, 3,000 here. We're not talking about a large number of builds still. Um, you know, over, I think in 2018, 19, and 20, we're talking about marginal, you know, increase in development. Now it's doubling and tripling. Um, again because wall street sees it says to kind of favor son yep i know we're hitting the top of the hour some of you may have to drop off so i'm just going to throw andy's contact information here real quick you guys should already have my contact information if not um, i'll throw it towards the end but here is andy's so back to back to Bill Torrent, right? I don't think you guys, you, you need me to explain who this guy is, the Oracle of Omaha, but back in a CNBC interview with 2012, he said, if I had a way of buying a couple hundred thousand homes, single family homes, I would load up on them. And obviously, you know, investors like us, a couple, we don't have the balance sheet that Berkshire Hathaway does, but we can invest in hundreds of homes, right? And that's what we're doing. It all comes down to investing at scale so that when your property management goes to manage the property, instead of, having to manage a property on the east side of Seattle, the west side of Seattle, the north and the south, all of your properties are in one centralized location. And you know, to pour more gasoline on the fire, for example, Goldman Sachs granted Fundrise, the crowdfunding platform, a $300 million line of credit to go out and invest in single family rental portfolios last year. So far in 2022, institutional investment has already exceeded $60 billion. And that's because they realized that, hey, it's always a game of supply and demand. And if, we don't, if we're short 4 million homes in the market, then that's what we got to invest in to be rewarded. And for context, I think we built what, maybe 500,000 last year. So we're talking about, and that's, that's to sell and rent, right? So we've still got a lot of catch up, right? We're still in the early stages. Yeah, and with supply chain issues where they are, the rising costs of labor and materials, like that's, it's gonna push a lot of builders. You know, I think it, it bears repeating too, like we kind of call it the, the triangle, this built to rent triangle, which I think is so powerful is that you're basically benefiting from the increase in interest rates because rents are going up, right? You don't necessarily wanna underwrite for that, but that's that's what is happening. So you got inflation, interest rates going up, rents going up. Then you have lack of supply, four million. If you're saying underneath that, that's 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 crazy. I think that's NPR's number. Whatever you, if even it's two and a half million, whatever you believe that it is. And then the other one is the the, the third kind of peg, is that affordability gap that now, you know, you've you've got interest rates that are so high. There's a eight hundred fifty dollar delta between your mortgage payment and why not just buy a, as a young family come in you know, with your dog, go in the back, large backyard, you know, rent your home, you got all of your friends in your community and dogging trail, rock trails and new stuff there. And and just rent, um, you know, if you're starter home, you're buying something that's probably older and, and, and you're doing a lot of work to it. So this trend is, you know, this is here to stay. Yeah. So a lot of you are probably familiar with multifamily value add, where you go out and buy apartment buildings, renovate the interiors, and flip it to the next group 35 years later. And that's probably been the bread and butter of your commercial real estate portfolio. But it's harder to find those now, right? Because not many are left with these original cabinets from the 80s and 90s. There's not much more tearing out and renovating that you can do. 
And at some point, you can only apart renovate an apartment so much until it stops making sense to do so, right? You can't go into a market where the median income is forty thousand dollars, and then put granite countertops and the latest stainless steel appliances and smart home technology. So no one's going to pay for that, right? Because the income doesn't support it. And so, at a certain point, you can't just renovate what already exists. You have to add new inventory to the market, and that's what Build to Rent does. So here, you know, this goes back to that triangle of, you know, the perfect concoction of factors that Andy was mentioning, right? You have the tenants, you have city officials who are looking for more housing for people, and then you have investors. From the tenants' perspective, like we said, millennials are the peak, you know, they're your, they're your target customer in the real estate market right now. And they love built to rent because of the flexibility, right? no longer do you have to lock yourself down in new york georgia wherever you're living because you bought a home there you can try out new york you can try out atlanta you can try out austin and keep renting until you feel like you've seen enough and you want to settle down somewhere it's pet and remote friendly not pet not remote. i mean pet and family friendly also right you're not cramped next to each other like you are in apartments you have that backyard you have space in front of your home. Also, your kids can run around, your dog can run around. You don't have to worry about maintaining it either. If something breaks, that's usually on the property management company. They come by and take care of the lawn. You know, a lot of my coworkers yesterday, we were sitting at lunch. They were complaining about owning a home, having to mow the lawn and fix stuff that gets broken. That's all taken care of in a built rent community. And affordability, again, because it is a rental and you're not buying buying the home, right? Second, from this government, you know, city planning officials perspective, they love it because of the amenities and the aesthetics that you're able to put in place. So you're not cramming people next to each other in an, like you have an apartment, but you're not providing them with zero amenities like you are in typical uh, subdivisions of single family homes either. You're giving them space in the backyard, like we said, but you're also putting that clubhouse in, you're also putting landscaping in and pools, grill areas, et cetera. And lastly, investors love it because of the economies of scale, like they do commercial real estate in general, lower maintenance costs because this is a class A product, it's a new build. So you're not gonna have to spend, you know, 40 to 50%, let's say 50% of your revenue on maintaining it, right? We're seeing around 35 to 40% of your revenue coming out for expenses in maintaining the community. And the exit strategies are a lot more lucrative because you have these big institutional investors who are willing to buy out the product that you invested your hard-earned money in. So in the words of Michael Scott, it's a win-win-win. And Andy's gonna get sick of he's, that. He's wise, he's a wise one. I, I would like to add to that a little bit that, so what we're finding is that the tenants are a lot, the residents we call them, are a lot stickier, right? They'll stay longer. Right. So if you, your typical multifamily, maybe they're staying a year or two years. These are staying twice that. Right. The leases are usually two years. Um, the other thing that I, I was reading yesterday in a report, I think Fixer, F-I-X-R. Um, so about 33 percent. So as we're trying to identify properties that make sense in markets that make sense, we really need the topography to be right. Right. So we don't want to be clearing a lot of trees. We want it to have an area where there's growth and low crime and all the kind of factors that you guys are are you know used to seeing in your investments but then they've got to be next to schools because about 35 percent of the of the residents that we have are younger families with kids and then another 33 or so are with just couples single uh, or excuse me uh, married couples young couples usually and then you're seeing a lot more kind of the empty nesters come in so a lot of the stuff that we're bringing in is to to be tailored towards that audience and the other thing that I thought was interesting is the things that are most sought after in these built to rent communities. The pool, it, you would think, would be one, the clubhouse. No, it's typically the green spaces, as you mentioned, Keisha, if the big backyards, because about 70 percent of these built to renters, you know, have a dog. Right. So the doggy doors, those kinds of things that make it really nice and open that they can interact with their neighbors. So I think that's kind of encapsulating why just logically it makes sense for you know these younger couples to be gravitating to these communities
Andy is gonna hate me if he sees this no, picture I mean, one more time. A picture, man. I mean, this is like, like if I was the GC, I'd be like, Whoa, wait a second, my beautiful work here being displayed yeah. on the interior. You've got like a half painted with none of the. It's just molts. There's no. There's no uh, sod. I mean, th th this is an embarrassment, man. But anyways, we'll, 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 I'll, I will. I will say that the the. Uh, the community is starting to look a little bit better on the exterior because we got the, the green spaces and the parks and all that. But, uh, you know, I'll sell, you. sell the sex with the uh, interiors, Keisha. <laughs> so that's that's all of the hope, cold hard facts. So we'll take a break from that and kind of look some pretty pictures, right? This is a home, one of the 98 homes um, in our project in Lafayette, Louisiana that we're working on right now. Eight of them are built and these are what they look like. So they're 1200 square feet, three bedroom, two bathroom. The exterior will be painted as you will see in a few slides. But here you have your kitchen, right? Very modern finish. Um, here in the living room, again, the kitchen, like, yeah, class A product for sure. Living rooms, bathrooms, and this is on Zillow also, if you guys want to go take a look. So here's what we envision for the community. We're not going to leave the houses unpainted, right? They'll be colorful. But these are the 98 homes. There's that pond we talked about, that dog park also with in the shape of a bone, jogging trails around the back. Those are the amenities that we're putting in. So these are some sample numbers for an upcoming opportunity that we're working on raising like $2 million for um, in Alabama. So let's say you invest 100K, right, to give you numbers for comparing it to multifamily apartments that you might be investing in. Year one and year two, you're going to have almost no cash flow. This is because of the rising interest rates on the loan that we're hopefully about to lock down here in a few days we are paying nine and three quarters in interest, right? And that would have been unheard of even earlier this year, but the Fed wants to fight inflation. So that high interest rate really limits the cash flow that you can distribute to your investors. Now, year three, between year two and year three is where we plan to refinance, right? At that point, we've stabilized the community. We have renters in there. We have steady income. We don't underwrite for refinances in our projections because who knows where the market is going to go. But, um, you know, going to that question earlier, let's say we do refinance, we can pull out anywhere between 40 to 60% of our investors' capital in year three and get that moving for them again and, you know, wherever they want to put it. Year four and year five is going to be pretty limited cash flow, again, um, because of the leverage that you have on the product and your big payday is going to come on the sale right here you're going to have 57 percent on the sale alone so putting those numbers together that's 109 percent roi in five years and that's including a lot of risk mitigants that we will go into on the next slide and those numbers obviously were just you know examples a, or approximate examples, I should say. So given all that, right, the returns, the market, the conditions that we're going through is built to rent too good to be true, right? We have to weigh, as investors, we have to weigh these investments objectively and go by the numbers. So on the risks side, right, construction is inherently riskier than renovation. You know, creating a new home is a lot harder than just tearing out the flooring and replacing it in a home that's already built. Cash flow is pretty limited, right? Not only in years one and two, but even later on, 5% cash flow. You know, multifamily is probably kicking off 8%. And lastly, construction loans are typically floating rate and can rise with rising interest rates. Like I said, we were originally looking at five and a half, you know, five, six months ago, five and a half interest rate on our construction loan for the 98 homes in Louisiana. Now we're looking at nine and three quarters. We have to go back out and raise that capital from investors. Um, I think so that we can stick with. You start, sorry, I didn't mean to jump. I, I just think it's an interesting story because when we started this, you know, SOFR, which is basically the kind of, so you have your spread, let's say your spread for your loan would be somewhere in that 5%, you know, if you're doing construction 
and then maybe so far at some point would I think I think we, we started off at like five and a half percent spread plus so far so far at one point was like 20 basis points now it's like 300 right so at a certain point you know we buy the cap obviously and our numbers have to make sense and, and you know we talk about you know is good too good to be true well really nothing is right especially because we it could be it, 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 it could be that there's you know there's something down down the down the pike that we're not going to be able to refi so we need to have all those we know what our max is we know what what we're what we're set up for on our um cap on our cap and we know that we've got a contingency that's pretty healthy on these deals and we have to account for the fact that cap rates might go up right if they go up 20 basis points a year we got to be able to cap account for that. So, um, you know, I just, I just, I think people are always kind of curious, like how are these interest rates determined and how is it affecting development? I think it, it affects multifamily more now because you've got cap rates that are still in those fours or fives and you're paying eight or 9% for your leverage. So that means you got negative leverage. So you got to have either a, 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 a new project with a lot of upside potential and a value add, um, but you can't expect a whole lot of cash flow in most of these deals. So I don't think those eight, nine percent on the multifamily are, are realistic either. Yeah. One way to mitigate the risk from those rising interest rates is to buy a rate cap, right? You go to the bank, you say, hey, I'm going to pay a couple hundred thousand dollars. And let's just make sure that no matter what the Fed wants to do with the interest rates, we pay at most, let's say what we're doing right now is nine and three quarters percent. So that you know mitigates the risk up to a level. And then you can just underwrite using that max and assume that you're always just gonna stay at that max for the duration of your development. So that's another thing, right? Always assume the worst in your interest rates, never assume you can refi. Obviously, as you do with multifamily, be conservative with your exit cap rates and rents. Have your contingency reserves, right? Construction's gonna be delayed and over budget. Well, we, the industry standard is 5%, right? Whatever your construction budget is, pad on 5% to make sure in case things go sideways, you're covered and you don't have to go back to investors. We like to be a little safer. We put, you know, 13%, for example, on our deal. So that's some numbers to give you reference for how to underwrite these deals. And another thing you can do to be conservative is say, hey, I know I'm confident I can build 10 homes a month, but let's just underwrite to say I can build six a month. So there are all these little things that you can do to mitigate the risk for yourself and investors. And lastly, construction is based on an IRR based waterfall. Well, I don't know if all it is, but at least the projects we do is. And what that means is usually in multifamily, you will get a preferred return. Let's say it's 10% for easy numbers. You'll get 10% each year, every year the project is running. And what happens is once you hit that 10%, anything beyond that is split 70% to you, 30% to the sponsor team. In, in the developments, we what we do is instead of doing that kind of waterfall, we do an IRR based waterfall where not only do you get that 10%, but you also get your initial capital back before the sponsor team starts sharing in that 30% of the profits. So in summary, right, built to rent, right now we are seeing the perfect tailwind factors to support construction. There's low supply, rising interest rates, and high inflation, institutional investor interest, a more remote and flexible lifestyle that people are looking for around the world, you know, that COVID kind of brought around. And it's a recession, right? There's that saying that, mil not millionaires, but um, what is it? You make your money when you buy, not when you sell. So like Warren Buffett says, be greedy when others are fearful, be fearful when others are greedy. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Um, you know, the, the thing that I would add to that is that um, this is there, there's going to be a lot of opportunity. And I know there's probably many people on this call that, you know, they've got some of their money in the market and 
you know, their IRA is down or what, whatever, that, but there's going to be a lot of opportunities. And I think that people are maybe, you know, preaching to the choir here a little bit about real estate in general. But when you just consider the number of ways that you can be making money in real estate, you know, the depreciation would be able to give about 60, 70 percent on most of our deals, even next year where it goes down a step. Um, but this year, too, this year is probably the best opportunity for you to get in if you're trying to to to, um, you know, to write off. Um, and then I just think that as we've already started to see land come down, um, we can still build relatively inexpensively in a lot of these areas in the south. Um, partly because the communities um, want these types of projects in their neighborhoods. Um, they, they, there's, there's not the same kind of risk, uh, the, um, you know, um, you know, traffic mitigation needed as you would in a, you know, an apartment building. It's, it's on the street. These are kind of their own contained communities, um, green parks, all the stuff that kind of people in a community really want to be. And I think it makes sense in a lot of secondary and tertiary markets. I saw. Sharon's question, um, and I'll just answer it now, Keshef, and because I know that we're probably going to take some more questions here soon as we're wrapping up. But, you know, the part of the story of the reason that we really love the idea of Foley, Alabama, you know, Lafayette, you know, uh, Louisiana, you know, that seems like a secondary, probably a tertiary market. Right. But we've got boots on the ground. And again, we find areas that have growth, good schools you know, um, areas that are close to amenities. Foley, Alabama, first time I looked at it, I'm like, well, why is DR Horton going there? Why is DSLD going? Why are some of these institutions going to Foley, which in and of itself is probably maybe 20,000 people, but it basically in between kind of Pensacola, um, Mobile on the other side, you've got so much growth in Baldwin County. It's the highest growth area in all of Alabama. Um, and so what we decided to do is like, well, let's follow some of those other institutions and where they're going and building projects because one, they're selling them off to other developers, but two, it just means that there's a lot of city support, county support and getting these projects approved. And that's exactly what we experienced um, in that community. So here's our contact information. I'll throw it here in the chat. Andy's is already up above. That, not that, but that's what we had for you today. And let's hear from some of you all about any questions you have about Build to Rent or development in general. Um, I had a uh, two questions actually related to to underwriting. One is uh, you spoke about SOFR, and if you could just explain what SOFR is compared to you know people are familiar with the funds rate or other rates yeah yeah i mean well so so basically it used to be like when i was like i've been in this game for a while um it used to be that you would you know you'd be on libor plus whatever the spread is right. so let's just say you know it's basically just a you know overnight financing rate but if the spread so as we call the spread let's say that's the base rate so if the interest rate is five percent plus so far is usually what most of the lenders are doing today so if SOFR fluctuated in our case from 20 basis points up to 3% or 300 basis points, it's a pretty big gap, right? Now, so SOFR might come down. I think SOFR today is like 304 or something like that. Um, it was 250 two weeks ago. So, so basically what I'm suggesting most people consider doing is it's not cheap, but if you buy a rate cap, You've got your spread and you buy a rate cap of like, let's say three and a half in the case of, of, you know, SOFR. So if it goes above three and a half, you're not, there's no more interest rate increase. Right. And so maybe you have to pay a couple hundred grand for that. You know, you've got to build that into your underwriting, but you know that you're, you can support your project over the long term if interest rates stay up above the nine, whatever that is. So let's say it's, five plus three and a half that's eight and a half you know you know if it goes above eight and a half you're good for your underwriting for that time being of your loan let's say it's three years whatever 48 months but if it comes down a little bit then obviously you're going to be benefiting from the reduction so um yeah so that is, that is a it's a totally different game we've seen a lot of operators right case shift and just talking with them where they were getting in you know deals where uh, multifamily deals at three and a half 
but they had no rate cap. So, you know, all of their underwriting was based on three and a half, you know, interest rates without, without a rate cap. No one, no one could have predicted up in the eight and a half, right? I'm sure some people did, but I, I wasn't certainly smart enough to predict that. Um, and, I, and I've also never, I've been in this game for a long time. I've never experienced a situation where it actually signed the docs, you know, and then, you know, basically changing the the LTC, you know, afterwards. So or you, you get a lot of loans where maybe it's closer saying, hey, it's three weeks out and you better get a backup plan or whatever, but never after I've signed docs. So it's a completely, it were in completely foreign territory as far as the capital markets go. Uh, Keshav, I had a question for uh, you around um, just multifamily versus built to rent. So I know you invested in multifamily early on. Andy did as well. And then, um, you know, there's the strategy of switching to built to rent. I have my um, inklings as to why that might be a good investment strategy. But do you want to highlight some of the, the considerations you had? Yeah, I still like, Andy and I still like multifamily, um, but it's just, it's harder to find those deals nowadays. Oh, he just left. Uh, I guess it must be serious. Oh, there he is. It's just harder to find those deals nowadays. Like I said, like there's only so much renovating you can do to apartment until the market can't support it anymore. And everyone's chasing these deals also. Everyone is becoming a syndicator. Everyone's raising funds. Um, and going after these deals, it's not just the people, you know, with golf club memberships and yachts that do this anymore. Anyone can go out there and syndicate. So it increases the competition for that. Uh, so developments, I would say more difficult than, you know, your value add opportunities. And then the smart money is chasing built rent, as we've seen. That's where institutional investor demand is going. They see the benefit of holding on to a portfolio where you have hundreds of homes consistently paying you rent every month. And I would say those are the big things. Um, and then obviously your upside's a lot higher, right? So if you're looking for capital growth, build rents better. If you want to create a legacy, it's a lot, we like to refi, we would like to refinance out of the deals, hold them. Uh, Andy loves the phrase golden, golden goose. So a lot of these people, they'll sell multifamily after a while. And I guess you could keep multifamily also, but we like to develop these and then refinance out of them, hold them, and you know see that 10%, 12% cash flow just coming in consistently every month. Yeah, so we had a, uh, I think it was a 600 unit portfolio. We partnered up with another group, um, a multifamily built in the 70s, probably a B minus. Um, really got a huge boost from just the market at the time um and a low interest rate um you know thankfully we bought the the rate cap um but we're not going to be able to refinance that that sucker you know for for a while now we can't we can't get that money out and the capital back and it's too bad because it's appreciated a ton because you know we've had some the rents have been so so high and maybe we'll be able to get some capital out but we're going to be paying a lot of you know the cost of capital is really expensive i think to to Keisha's point the other problem is for the last 10 years, multifamily syndicators have been able to kind of buy value add. So maybe it's, let's say it's a 200 unit apartment building, you know, build out 50 of the units, add value for those, leave some more for some more meat on the bone for the next guy. And then the next guy, and then the next guy. And at some point there's just, you've got negative leverage because you're paying your, any new properties, you're paying your seven, 8%. Let's say you could, you're in the sixes even, and your cap rates are, you know, with the fours, it's, it's, you know, you're, you're, you're at some point you're going to be pretty close to the same cap rate as the same, as the same um, rate. And then you've got negative leverage. So it's kind of a tricky game to be in the multifamily, but I still like it. We did a deal in Houston this year, but, but they were just, they were really hard to find, right? There wasn't, it wasn't the same kind of like, Oh, the mayor loves that you guys are doing this in your project. You know, why don't you take this credit or that credit? You know, that's great. And and um, it goes without saying, but the earlier you get into a project, the more your IRR is correct. Um, so at each stage, there's a, there's a, um, a basically an exit um, benefit that you're seeing that you're uh, actualizing at the end of the stage. 
So if you get in earlier, the higher the ROI, but then if you get in later, you know, you'll still be able to realize the ROI for that particular stage, but you won't be able to realize the benefits from earlier stages. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of them are set up, you know, just like like you guys are investing in other companies. You know, there's a there's a seat kind of round, and something a little more risky, and then you you basically kind of recapitalize. So at each stage, there's value creation, right? And so in some cases, you know, investors that say, hey, like I just like to wait and see if you guys get to vertical. Well, we might not get to vertical if we're able to roll over equity with each stage, right? Um, some lenders aren't going to give you credit for that kind of what they would call, you know, lift development lift to equity lift but um there is still some specialty lenders out there that will allow you to roll over your equity so at each stage somebody comes in earlier now they basically get a, a newer valuation and then a newer valuation so that's that's kind of that's kind of the risk and the reward of coming in built to rent early um uh, i have one last question which is uh, if you have an investor coming in at the end of well, any of these really any of these phases, but if you're uh, if they're interested in not acquiring the entire property, but just certain pieces of the property, um, and you've zoned, you know, with the city, with uh, your municipality in a certain manner, do you have to go back to the um, municipality and rezone so that you can accommodate that acquisition? So, are you referring to like what they're individually platted, like in yeah. Yeah, like um, if, uh, typically, I mean, residential, like you're zoned one way and right. uh, you uh, can't say you can sell it uh, another way, another zoning um, parameter. So do you have right. to rezone it or is it because- No, no, so, it's a way. So, so let's say for, for instance, Lafayette, we would zone for built to rent, but they're all individually platted. If we wanted to sell off 10, we could do that without having to rezone. Now it's much more difficult if, if, if in our situation, if we've got a loan with, you know, the Arbor or Corvest, one of the larger lenders, right? Because they're not, they don't, they don't want, they don't want us selling off small pieces of it. Right. So there is some, you're, you're kind of a handicap depending on the letter, the, the lender that you go, but let's say the community bank, which is another project that we have, you know, if we decide to sell that off, no, we don't have to go get a rezone. It's zoned for for multi for um, pulled apart multifamily or horizontal multifamily or built to rent, whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's sites that we've got now that we're looking at that are industrial, and the area needs housing, and they know it needs housing, and they're going to help push us through the zoning. But we, but but uh, I was confused by your question because you were saying like maybe I could just buy into a portion of it. Um, you we would basically be selling a portion of it we we would right. break up the investment um you know to sell off a piece of the investment we would sell the entire syndication and then you're investing in the kind of operator to dictate how we dispose of the property when it becomes time to to exit yep that makes sense yeah great well thank you very much both uh to you andy as well as kishav um, and we learned quite a bit. This is recorded. So for all those that missed a portion or a good portion of this, uh, this will be recorded. Uh, and of course, Andy and, and uh, Kishav, we do have your contact information. If you're interested in Build to Rent or any of the projects that uh, either Cloud Capital or Legacy is working on, please do reach out to them and um, everyone have a good day. Thanks again. Yeah, John, thanks for making this happen, man. I appreciate it. No problem. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend.